Let's pray together. Father, we are grateful for your mercy. Lord, without it, the Bible says we would be consumed because you are so holy and we are so unholy. But I'm grateful that every morning we wake up, we wake up to a fresh account of your mercy. Thank you that it never runs out. Thank you so much for what you've done in all of our lives. Lord, I want to pray for that one person in here today. Maybe it's more than one. That has never known your mercy, your grace, your love, and your forgiveness in a personal way. They've searched for it in other things. But they've never found it in your son Jesus. But they find themselves at church today. Father, I pray that you would save their soul. We can't make that decision for them. We can't force them to make that decision for themselves. But we pray that through the power of your word, we pray through the drawing conviction of the Holy Spirit, that there would be the salvation of that lost soul today. At the end of the service, when we see new converts getting baptized and coming into the membership of our church, I pray that we would celebrate the fact that in their life, your mercy was more. And it's still more. We love you. Be at the center of attention the entire service, please. It's in Jesus' name we pray. All the church said amen. You may be seated. Enjoy the choirs. They sing a very, very touching song entitled, Thank You, Jesus, for the Blood of Life. was a wretch. I remember who I was. I was lost. I was blind. I was running out of time. Sin separated. The breach was far too wide. But from the far side of the chasm, you had me in your sight. So you made a way across the great divide, left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside. And there at the cross, you paid the debt I owed, broke my chains, freed my soul for the first time.
hope you never get over the fact that Jesus died on the cross for you. That he shed his blood on Calvary for you. That he took mocking and ridicule and scorn and pain. Most of all, being forsaken by his own father for you. And if you've not been to the foot of the cross, if you've not been saved today, hear the words of these songs. As believers all around you will sing the gospel. And let it change your heart today. Let it stir your spirit. Stand and worship with us. There's a place where mercy reigns.
such comfort but if you walk in the light as he is in the light we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ has cleansed his son cleanseth us from all sin do you believe in the blood of Jesus today my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus blood and righteousness we can't boast in our own works they fall short every time but through Christ we can be made right with the Father. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust. Oh 
close your eyes. Let's talk to the Lord. Pastor Tanner, come with our prayer. God, with grateful hearts and thankfulness and praise that we get to gather as a church family, that we get to start our week off with worship and praise and adoration of you and your son and your spirit. Father, thank you for such a great start to our service. Thank you for the the spirit that's in the room tonight or this morning. Father, we want to thank you for the pure gospel of Jesus Christ that we have received. I'm thankful that that in this room this morning there are, are people of different backgrounds, cultures, financial standings, whatever the case may be, but but the gospel is the same to us all. And it's pure. And it's perfect. And it's capable of, of saving each and everyone in here. God, we want to thank you for Jesus who gave himself in our place to die in our place for our sins. Thank you for the blood that he shed upon that cross. God, I pray that this morning you would draw our hearts as Christians, as believers, as the church family, draw our hearts closer to you and to your son. In our hearts, help us to love and appreciate and live for the gospel even more. God, we want to pray and and thank you this morning that we don't have to jump through hoops to get to you. That we don't have to to pay the church any type of money. That we don't have to get baptized. That we don't have to, to do some sort of good work. That we don't have to earn anything from you. Father, we want to thank you that, that we can be justified. That we can made, be made right in your sight through faith in Jesus alone. Thank you for that. God, I ask you that you would move someone this morning to exercise that faith in Christ alone. If there's anyone here, Lord, that that doesn't know your son Jesus as their savior, would you please prick their hearts, convict them, draw them by your spirit and help them to, to see Christ for who he is and to see themselves for who they are and how much they truly need a savior. God, we thank you for your spirit that draws us. Thank you for giving your Holy Spirit to each and every believer that is in this church house this morning. Father, we want to ask that your spirit lead us into even more worship and adoration and obedience to you and your word. God, speak to us through your word this morning. We need to hear from you. We have so many messages flying at us every single day of the week. And we have this one, this one sacred holy day that we have set aside to hear from you. So Lord, show up and help us hear from you. Holy Spirit, illuminate your word. Help us to see past just the the spoken word, the spoken message to to really what you have for us this morning, Holy Spirit. And then, Holy Spirit, we want to ask that you would anoint our pastor. Speak to us through him. Would you remove from him any distraction, any burden, any anxiety, anything that, that might be weighing him down? I have no clue, but would you just free him, liberate him to preach to us, your children. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus, and we love you, Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is risen. 
I remind you why we say that every once in a while here, because the early church, historians tell us, that's how they greeted each other on the Lord's Day. Up into the book of Acts, uh, they were meeting on Saturdays, and then uh, when Christ decided to come up from the grave, they said, that's worth celebrating every week. And uh, he rose again on Sunday, and so they started meeting together on Sunday, and most of us greet each other with, hey, how are you? The early Christians greet each other this way. Christ is risen. And then the other person would say, that's why we, that's what we celebrate today. And uh, it's really what we celebrate uh, here in a couple of weekends from now, Resurrection Sunday. I would say that's probably the biggest date on the Christian's calendar, or it should be. It's our hope that we have in Christ. It's what sets him apart from any other false god that when he died, he didn't stay dead. And now we, we have hope through his resurrection uh, that we too will be resurrected. And, and I hope that you'll come back or planning to come back uh, on Easter Sunday. And I hope you're planning to bring somebody with you. This is a, an amazing day uh, for you to invite somebody to come and hear about the resurrected Christ. It's not just a day for those that are lost. Fundamentally, it's a day for those that are saved to celebrate the risen Savior. And we're going to do that. There's going to be application for believers. Maybe the majority of the sermon will be preached to believers. I don't know what God will lead me to preach on. Uh, but there will be the gospel preached on that day, as there is about every Sunday here at Fellowship. And so there's, there's cards in the back that you can take and hand out for Easter Sunday. Most importantly, we're going to have a collective effort next Sunday afternoon. This will take place of our normally scheduled evening service. We want to give you the entire afternoon to, to do what we call canvassing. We do this once a year as a church where we ask the entire church family uh, to come together. When you come to church next Sunday morning, you'll see in the foyer tables that will have these maps on them, and then they'll have a stack of Easter invite cards. And we want you to go and grab a map or two, and it'll have some streets highlighted in our community. And you'll go to those streets, take those Easter invites, you and your spouse or you and a friend or, or you and your kids, and you'll go to that street and you'll just go to every door and just put one of those in the door. We don't knock on the door. Uh, it's very non-confrontational in that, in that uh, way. But we want you to go to the door, leave an invite on the door, then just go to the next door and go to the next door. There hasn't been an Easter Sunday where we've done an all-church outreach like that where there hasn't been at least one person in our congregation that received an invite on their door. So you never know what that's going to accomplish. And so I hope that next Sunday, when you come to the morning service, that you'll grab a map. If you have time, grab two. Grab three. If you have kids, grab four. Um, and do that for us. And uh, then, then that will be a great, great help uh, to our service. We're really excited today uh, to welcome some new members into the fellowship family. All these folks have been through what we call fellowship 101, where they've either been saved as a result of Fellowship 101, or we've been able to affirm that they already have been saved and they understand the gospel. They're believing in Jesus Christ. They're repenting of their sin and they're in a relationship with Jesus. And, and, and they've been scripturally baptized uh, by immersion in a gospel preaching church. And, and, or they're getting baptized today. Um, even to come into the membership of our church. And we like to make a big deal about that because we believe, number one, saved people do get baptized. You don't get baptized to get saved, but saved people get baptized because they're unashamed of, the, of following Jesus Christ. And number two, it puts them into connection, a covenant um, commitment, really, they're making to our church and we're making to them, um, welcoming them into our fellowship family. We, church, here's what we're doing. This wasn't going to be planned, but I need to say this. When people get baptized... They are committing, not just to the Lord Jesus Christ, they're committing to his church, this church specifically. They're opening their lives to us. But at the same time, we're committing ourselves to them. And that means more than just clapping at the end of their baptism. That means we take responsibility. We make ourselves available to help them as they go along this spiritual journey. We don't just get them saved, dunk them and say, adios. This is the very beginning of their spiritual journey. You had a beginning too. And if it weren't for some seasoned Christians in a church that came alongside of you, you probably wouldn't be where you're at today. So when these folks get baptized today, we, 
we're making a commitment to them. They're making a commitment to us. Let me tell you who they are. I won't have them stand because you'll see them in the baptistry today. Uh, but Saul and Claudia Cavarubius are getting baptized today. Art Rivera is getting baptized today. Jeremiah Garcia is getting baptized today. And Kensington Kalowski is getting baptized today. Why don't you just give them a hand and welcome them into the fellowship family today. If you have any questions about membership, you can mark that on your connection card. Put it in the offering plate today. We don't pressure people in that regard, but we, we do, we do uh, believe that it's in the Bible. And we'd like to show you how you can become a member of God. So lead you to this church. Well, I, I came to the pulpit today and I had three golf balls on the pulpit. These are, my, these are my favorite golf balls, Callaway golf balls. These bright red golf balls. It's what I can see on the golf course, um, especially when I hit it in the ditch. Um, it's what I can see. I had three on here, and they were given to me by Jim Potts. Has anybody ever heard the name Jim Potts? Yeah. If you, if you don't know his name, just listen closely. You can hear him talking. Um, but Jim is, is a good golfing buddy of mine. He's right back there. And I saw him at the golf range, golfing range. When did we golf, Jim? Was it Friday? And uh, Jim's out there every day. And, and so I, I saw him at the golf range, and I said, Jim. You, you, if you shoot a, I said, what are you going to shoot today? He said, I'm going to shoot a 38 today. He's going to play nine holes. He's going to shoot two over. I said, if you shoot 38 or better, I owe you. He loves ties. He's fascinated with ties. I give him ties all the time. He said, I'll give you a tie for every stroke below 38. And, and I said, but if you shoot worse than 38, above 38, then I get one of my favorite golf balls for every stroke above that. And you can just do the math. And, and that's probably with him keeping score. If somebody else was keeping score, it would have been about nine balls probably. Um, appreciate that. Turning your Bible to Acts chapter 12. Let's hustle to the word today. Acts chapter number 12. We're in this series, A Church on Mission. We're going to read the entire chapter together to start. And the reason I'm doing that is because I want you to know what's going on. And it's going to help us move quicker through the sermon today. So get to Acts chapter 12, open your Bible, your device, and let's read together. I'll read aloud and you follow along quietly. Verse number one. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And when Herod would have brought him forth, the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself and bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he saith unto him, Cast thy garment about thee and follow me. And he went out and followed him and wist not that it was true, which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. When they were past the first and the second ward, they came into the iron gate that leadeth unto the city, which opened to them of his own accord. And they went out and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord has sent his angel, and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod, and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. And when he considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel came to hearken named Rhoda. Why did her mom name her Rhoda? That's rough. Verse 14, and when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. And they said unto her, thou art mad, or in other words, you're crazy. But she constantly affirmed that it was even so. Then, say, then said they, it's his angel. But Peter continued knocking. And when they'd opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. But he beckoning unto them with the hand to hold their peace, declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, go show these things unto James and to the brethren. And he departed and went into another place. Now as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers. What was become of Peter? And when Herod had sought for him and found him not, he examined the keepers and commanded that they should be put to death. 
And he went down from Judea to Caesarea and there abode. And Herod was highly displeased with them of Tyre and Sidon, but they came with one accord to him. And having made Blastus, there's another dandy of a name, the king's chamberlain, their friend, desired peace because their country was nourished by the king's country. And upon a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat upon his throne and made an oration unto them. And the people gave a shout, saying, It is the voice of a God and not of a man. And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him because he gave not God the glory. And he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. But the word of God grew and multiplied. And Barnabas, Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry and took with them John, whose surname was Mark. The title of the message today is this, God's power to care for his people. I want you to notice the very first phrase of chapter 12. Look at it. Now about that time. Luke is the author. And this is a transitional phrase that connects what we're about to study with what just happened in the life of this church. So, so to understand the context, we got to ask, what's happening about this time in the life of the early church? Well, chapter 11, verse 21 gives us an idea. Look at it in your Bible. And the hand of the Lord was with them. Chapter 11, verse 21. And a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. So we see here at this time in the church's life, they're experiencing the obvious presence and power of God. Luke puts it this way, the hand of the Lord was with them. Have you ever had one of those seasons of life where you could just sense God's hand, his presence, his guidance, his favor, his care? It was just so obvious in your life. You could see it, you could identify it, you could feel it. I know that I've sensed those seasons in my life. I've sensed those seasons in my family. I, I've sensed the seasons where God's hand was clearly so obvious in our church. That's what the early church was experiencing. But then we get to chapter 12 and it says now about that time. So about the time that God's people were experiencing forward momentum, about the time that God's people were seeing his hand so obviously providing for them and caring for them and blessing them, about that time, you read that phrase and it makes you wonder what's about to happen. Because verse 1 continues and it says, about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. Right about the time that everything was going good, life changes. Right about the time when everyone was getting saved and baptized and added to the church, circumstances change for the worse. This king named Herod launches an assault on the church. Who's King Herod? Well, there are a lot of Herods in the New Testament. Herod's a family name. It's not a first name. This particular Herod is known as Herod Agrippa. Herod Agrippa is the grandson of Herod the Great. Herod the Great is the one who tried to kill baby Jesus. Herod Agrippa here, they say, is about 50 years old at the time. Our text portrays him, though not so much as a king, but more so as a politician. At this point in history, King Herod has a problem. The people of his province weren't big fans of the family name Herod. They'd had some bad experiences. So Herod wanted to do something that would increase his popularity in the city, and he does what he's good at. He plays politics. Herod noticed that there's this new group of people called the Christians who were very unpopular with the religious leaders of Judaism. And the religious leaders of Judaism were very powerful. So Herod thinks, what better way to get the Pharisees and Sadducees on my side than to come out in opposition to their enemies, the Christians. And he does. It gets violent quickly. Herod goes straight to the top. He, he murders one of the church's prominent leaders and apostles named James. He likely beheads him with the sword. We're talking about the James that was part of Jesus' inner circle along with Peter and John. There's later going to be another James that comes along that's going to be instrumental in the leadership of the church. This is a different James, the original apostle James. This is someone the believers in the church loved dearly. They looked up to for spiritual guidance and wisdom. 
In fact, if you've been in this journey through Acts with us, then you know the church is probably just now getting over the grief of, of, their, of their friend Stephen who, who died violently. Now they lose again one of their most revered apostles. What makes this so hard is that they were just experiencing God's hand, God's care, God's obvious blessing, and then without warning, things change, and now they're having another funeral. But it gets worse. When Herod noticed how much the execution of James pleased the people, remember he's playing politics, he wanted to do the same thing to Peter, another leader of the church, another apostle. Not because Peter and James were some political revolutionaries, but because Herod is playing this political game. So, so he puts Peter on death row. He arrests him and he sentences him to death. Now I want you to understand where God's people find themselves here. They had been celebrating the salvation and baptism of so many new converts on one day. And the next day they're grieving the execution of one apostle and the arrest of another. The rug is literally being pulled out from underneath them with the snap of Herod's finger. I want to ask you, has that ever happened in your life? Is that happening in your life right now? Have you ever been in a good season? A season where you just knew God's hand was on you. You could see it. You could feel it. There was no mistaking that God cared for you. But then everything changed. One phone call from the doctor's office. And now you find yourself discussing what he saw on a scan that concerns him. One phone call from a family member telling you that your loved one's been in an accident and it's not looking good. One meeting with your boss and you walk out without a job. One bill that comes in the mail and your day goes from great to terrible because you have no idea where the money's going to come from. One appointment with your child's teacher and now you're finding out something about your child's behavior at school that totally shocks you. One day out of nowhere, your marriage goes from good to really bad. One negative pregnancy test and once again you're reminded of your infertility and what feels like an impossibility of ever having your own biological children. I'm talking about seasons of life where one minute God's care couldn't be questioned, but the next minute you find yourself in such a threatening circumstance that you're questioning God's power to care for you today like He has yesterday. You're laying awake at night wondering, where did God go? His hand was just on me, and now it's just disappeared. He was so present, and now He's so silent. Does He even care? Here's the question of the text today. How do we respond when we find ourselves in a situation where God's power to care for us is called into question by threatening circumstances? The people of God in this church responded in two positive ways. Look at verse 5. Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. Here's what we should do first. Pray for God's intervention. When King Herod attacks with the sword, the people of God counter with prayer. I believe it should always be the believer's response during times of trial. And let me call a time out just for a second. If you're wanting to know, man, I was hoping for a more profound answer than that. Just pray. That's Christianese. Can you give me more help than that? Then you're not getting the point. Prayer is the point. Now, one might wonder about the church's response here. Why not take up arms? Force? Protest? I do think there might be times when when an outcry is appropriate. But I believe believe for for believers, prayer should always be the first, and, and it's always the best response. See, prayer is the believer's weapon. Prayer is the church's weapon. And using it isn't weak. Using it isn't passive. Prayer isn't a retreat. It's an act of holy defiance. It's an act of place independent confidence in the sovereign God who hears the prayers of his people and rules over all. Prayer is powerful, church. In the words of John Piper, prayer is a wartime walkie-talkie. I like that. 
The church is at war, so they call up the command, commander who shuts lions' mouths, humiliates pharaohs, breaks chains, and opens prison doors, knowing he will act in whatever way he knows is best. And the church said amen. amen. Can I ask you today, how do you regard prayer? Is your initial response to conflict one of planning and protesting? Or like these believers, is it, is it petitioning and, and pleading the Lord? See, I think we could learn from the church of Jerusalem that while the kingdom of darkness uses physical weapons, believers should first and foremost use the spiritual weapon of prayer. And this church we're reading of in Acts 12 would need to be serious about prayer because the wicked, power-hungry, political King Herod was very serious about not just killing James. That was already done. He was very serious about killing Peter next. I know that because verse 6 says that Herod assigned Four squads of four soldiers each to guard Peter. Are you with me? Sixteen guards total for one guy. That sounds overboard to me. But it's probably not to Herod because Herod had heard what happened in Acts 5 when Peter already escaped prison once before. That wasn't going to happen on his watch. But I want you to notice something. I want you to notice what Peter was doing in prison. He was sleeping. And it said he was sleeping between two soldiers. He's not biting his nails. He's not pacing the floor. He's not trying to negotiate a deal. The dude is sleeping. And get this, he's sleeping so deeply that the angel had to jab him to wake him up. I mean, I I, I guess he had sleep apnea. He needed a CPAP machine. I don't know. Or it could be this. He just had the peace of God. He knew God was in control. He'd been in a prison cell before. He'd been under persecution before. He stood before the Sanhedrin before. It reminds me of Philippians chapter 4. Be careful for nothing. In other words, don't worry. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And as a result, here's what will happen. The peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep our guard, your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Do you see how prayer and peace are connected? The verse tells us that instead of worrying, we should pray, and when we do, we'll be kept or we'll be guarded by the peace of God. Think about this. Peter's body, hear me, His body was guarded by soldiers, but his heart and his mind were guarded by peace. And you may find yourself in a situation that feels like a a darkened prison cell that's inescapable, but I'm here to tell you that you can still sleep at night. You can still know the sweet peace of God that surpasses all understanding when you pray. Listen, if it's big enough to worry about, it's big enough to pray about. And take assurance that if it's on your heart, it's on God's mind. So pray through your imprisoned moments. You may not be freed right away. I'm going to be honest with you. You may not be freed at all. But you can have peace. Knowing that through it all, God is still in control. So here we are. The church is praying while Peter's sleeping. It was the middle of the night and an angel steps inside. Now, we don't know all the details, but the angel wakes Peter up, tells him to get dressed, and walks out through three separate gates and outside the prison walls. Our text tells us that that Peter almost feels like this whole thing's a dream. It feels surreal until he's standing in the street outside the prison, a free man. I don't know, maybe he pinches himself, rubs his eyes, feels the wind. I don't know. But eventually he realizes that this thing's for real. More importantly, what he recognizes next in verse 11 is is so important. Because he confessed this, God delivered me from Herod. He he, He didn't think it was a coincidence. He didn't think it was a fluke. He didn't think he had a lucky day. He said, God delivered me from Herod. Listen, Peter stands in the street as a freed man because of the power of God alone. And little did he know that a group of believers had been assembled and praying through the night that this very thing would happen. Isn't it awesome 
when you pray specifically for God to do something and then he does it? This is where the story gets kind of humorous because these believers were about to see the answer to their prayer show up at their front door. And yet when the prayer, answer to their prayer shows up at the front door, it's almost like they didn't want it to show up. Here's what happens. Peter walks down to Mary's house. This is a common place where the believers would gather and pray and fellowship. That girl by the name of Rhoda heard a knock on the door. She was a servant girl. She answered the, well, she was going to answer the door, but then she heard Peter's voice. And she got so excited that she didn't even let him in. She just immediately interrupted the prayer meeting to tell everyone that God had answered their prayers. Now, think about that. Peter was an escapee. The last place he needed to be was outside in an open courtyard where authorities could locate him. Poor Rhoda was too excited to remember to even let him in the house. It gets worse. When Rhoda tells the church that Peter's at the door, no one will believe her. They say, you're crazy. Now, at first, this doesn't make sense to me. They're praying through the night for God to free Peter, for God to work out a miracle. And then when God does it, they don't believe it. That's shocking to me. But, but then I got to thinking, I've done the same thing. You've done the same thing. We've all prayed with an imperfect faith, haven't we? Come on now. So, so let's not be too hard on these believers. We have prayed believing God can, but we haven't always prayed believing God will. There are times when we're praying for the impossible in our life, and if that thing happened while you were praying, you wouldn't believe it either. So here they are telling Rhoda to go back to doing what she's doing because there's no one at the door. And Rhoda persists. No, Peter's there. I know his voice. Peter's there. And we read next where, where, where the people in the house started to theorize whether the man outside might have been Peter's angel. In other words, the, 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 the men are talking about theology as the answer to their prayer is standing outside. I'm imagining Peter's getting antsy. He just keeps knocking. Perhaps he pauses to whisper with more urgency, Rhoda, let me in the stinking house. The authorities are coming. Thankfully, the, the church eventually opens the door. Peter enters. And then it, it gets crazy. The church erupts. Yeah, I mean, you probably would too. Oh, it was Peter. Rhoda was right. Hey, Peter. How's it? And Peter's like, shh. Like, literally, he, he signals to them, the text says. Like, I don't think he wanted to say shut up, but this means shut up. <laughs> He's a wanted man in the middle of a city. Once they calm down, he goes on to tell them how the Lord had brought him out of prison. Hey, get this. Here's what we need to learn. Look at me. God has the power to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think. At moments in which we can't feel or see or trace his hand in our life when we're doubting whether or not he has the power to care for us and provide for us and bless us, we need to be reminded of this story. His power is immeasurable. Four squadrons of soldiers couldn't stand against his power. Three sets of prison bars couldn't stand against his power. A political scheme couldn't stand against his power. A, a power-hungry, murderous king couldn't stand against his power. And nothing that comes against you can stand against his power either. If God be for you, who can be against you? Here's the bottom line. Pray. When you need his protection, pray. When you need his provision, pray. When you need his care, pray. When you need a miracle, pray. Pray, because when we pray, we remind ourselves and we remind the world that God's power is greater than any earthly power. God's led me to put this exact text into practice because tonight we aren't going to have a typical preaching service. We're going to have a church-wide prayer meeting tonight. When I studied Acts 12, I thought, you know what? It's one thing to preach it. It's another thing to live it. And so when you come back to church, I didn't say if, I said when you come back to church at 6 o'clock because the doors of God's house are open, Christians come. I said when the doors of God's house are open, Christians come. That's just what happens. So saved people get baptized, saved people go to church. It's just what happens. So come back tonight at 6. Charles Spurgeon said something like this. If you want to see the health and strength of a church, don't look at it when it's singing. And don't look at it when it's preaching. Look at it when it's praying. 
See who shows up to a prayer meeting, and you'll see the health of a church. Because there's nothing flashy about a prayer meeting, is there? Nothing super entertaining about a prayer meeting. But as you can see in this passage, this is where the real business is had right here. So we're going to pray tonight. Nobody's going to be called upon to spontaneously pray in front of the church. or No one's going to be embarrassed. You're going to just pray by yourself at your seat. And we're going to have some folks lead prayer up here that are comfortable doing that. And we're going to have some specific things we're going to pray for as a church. And we're going to put Acts 12 to practice. If you're a new member, a prospective member, or just a regular attender, I want you to come back tonight. And I want you to experience what a praying church is like. We had one of these prayer meetings a couple weeks ago, and it was just special. It helped our souls. It refreshed us. It revived us. It was good for us. So what do we do? When we feel like the power of God to take care of us is being put to the test, we pray. But I want you to look how the text ends. I read it so long ago, you probably forgot it. So look at verse 20. This is right after Herod finds out. He, he puts to death the guys who didn't guard Peter. And, and then he, he moves on and he goes to uh, Caesarea and, and he abides there. And he's an angry man right now. Verse 20. And Herod was highly displeased with them of Tyre and Sidon. But they came with one accord to him. And having made Blastus, the king's chamberlain, their friend, desired peace. Because their country was nourished by the king's country. And upon a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat upon his throne and made an oration unto them. And the people gave a shout, saying, It is the voice of a God and not of a man. And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him, because he gave not God the glory, and he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. Here's our second response. When God's power to care for you is brought into question, wait for God's vindication. You pray for God's intervention. And then you wait for God's vindication. What did we just read? Well, Herod and the people around him are still playing politics. There's been a rift between Herod and the people of the neighboring coastal cities, Tyre and Sidon. It was the people they called the Phoenicians. The Phoenicians depended on importing food from Herod's province of Galilee, so they have to get back on Herod's good side. So they play the political card themselves. Verse 20 tells us that that they schemed to get a friend on the inside. They worked on a man named Blastus. He was very close to Herod, maybe a butler, a servant, a, a chief of staff. The implication is that the Phoenicians bribed Blastus to, to get him to pull strings for their cause, and it worked. One day the Phoenicians were able to be present to hear King Herod make a public speech. You might have heard of the Jewish historian Josephus. He tells us about this scene. He said Herod appeared in a robe made of silver. It was shining in the sun and he spoke to these people. He said the Phoenicians who who were happy to achieve their political goals through flattery cheered that the shining Herod spoke as a God and not a man. Of course, Herod in his pride didn't reject their praise, did he? He loved it. He welcomed it. He tried to steal God's glory. And so God smote him. Herod was struck with what what Josephus calls a terrible intestinal disease. And he died after five days of terrible pain. What's the point? Despite all his royal majesty, King Herod couldn't stand against the power of God. And here's what's great. The chapter ends with a contrast. A verse you might think is no big deal. But it's an amazing ending. Look at verse 24. But the word of God grew and multiplied. Watch this. Herod dies. The gospel triumphs. John Stott describes Acts 12 in this way. You've got to see the screen. The chapter opens with James dead, Peter in prison, and Herod triumphing. It closes with Herod dead, Peter free, and the word of God triumphing. Such is the power of God to overthrow hostile human plans and to establish his own in their place. Stott says, tyrants may be permitted for a time to boast and blunder, oppressing the church and hindering the spread of the gospel, but they will not last. In the end, their empire will be broken and their pride abased. The writer of Acts, Luke, I think he put this chapter together like he did to make this plain to the early church. I think he's saying this. You may feel small and you may feel insignificant in the Roman Empire. 
You may think that you're overpowered with, 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 with some of the, your best leaders being killed on a political whim. But Luke said, here's the truth. If you stay with Jesus, you win. But if you oppose Jesus, you lose. So he writes this to say, church, be encouraged. Be bold. Be courageous. Go spread the word of truth and leave the outcome to God. He'll always take good care of you. Two application points of will home. First, don't overestimate the power of wicked government. We worry sometimes, don't we, about the authorities and rulers over us. And it's true that at times they'll take advantage of their power and use it against the church. But this chapter reminds us that no matter how evil government is or becomes, God is still in control. Through his power, the gospel can still move forward. So hear me, Christian. You don't need to be hoarding and building bunkers in your basement. You don't need to be obsessing about the threat of communism and socialism all the time. Instead, share the gospel in the power of Christ. Don't overestimate the power of wicked government. God's over them. Secondly, don't underestimate the power of a caring God. All of the Herods in the world can stand against God, but, but Peter still walked out of that prison. The word of God still prospered. Herod, Nero, Stalin, Castro, and I can name many more. They're all dead. But guess who's not dead? The king of kings. And the Lord of Lords, Christianity's not dead. The gospel's not dead. God's not dead. And the church isn't dead. We are on the winning side. So don't underestimate for one second the power of a caring God. And don't underestimate what he can do in your life as you pray for divine intervention and wait for divine vindication. What an incredible passage, isn't it? What an incredible moment for these believers. The moment their threatening circumstances are call God's power to care for them into question, they didn't resort to fear. They didn't resort to self-pity. They didn't just pick up their Bible, go home, and never come back to church. They didn't even power up against the government. They got on their knees and they prayed. And then they waited for God to make things right. If you find yourself in threatening circumstances right now that's causing you to question God's care for you, the circumstances of your life have, have, have taken a turn for the worst and you're having a hard time trusting God today and thinking that everything's going to be okay tomorrow. Let me read you the lyrics of one of my favorite songs we sing here and we're going to close our service by singing this as loud as we can. It's based on Psalm 62 and it's called My Soul Will Wait. When the enemy surrounds and my heart grows faint within, when the darkness overwhelms and my fears are pressing in, I will trust in you, O Lord. In the silence, I will wait. I will stand upon your word. You're my solid rock and my salvation, my steadfast hope that won't be shaken. My soul will wait. My soul will wait for you. The second verse, you're my stronghold and my shield. This is like Acts 12 right here. In the midst of every threat, Though the wicked never yield, they will vanish like a breath. Yes, I know the outcome, sure. Satan's evil plans will fail. In your power, I'm secure. The song ends with prayer. Pouring out our hearts before you, we will trust in you. Perfect Savior, strong defender, we will trust in you. Pray for God's intervention. Intervention then wait on God's vindication. He is powerful over all. Stand to your feet. Let's worship with this song.
I will trust in you, O oh Lord. In the silence I will wait. I will stand upon your word. You're my solid rock and my salvation, my steadfast hope that won't be shaken. My soul will wait. My soul will wait for you. Here's the second verse. You're my stronghold and my shield. In the midst of every threat, though the wicked never yield, they will vanish like a breath. Yes, I know. solid rock and my salvation my steadfast hope that won't be shaken my soul will wait my soul will wait for you you're my comfort sing it you're my comfort when I feel forsaken my refuge and my sure foundation my soul will wait, my soul will wait for you. This is love I can't explain, yes. This is mercy unreserved through your sacrifice. Here's the peace. I have peace that's undeserved. Here's why. For the battle has, you believe it? Come on. And I fear no shame or loss. Now the sting of death is gone. You're my solid rock and my salvation, my steadfast hope that will my soul will wait, my soul will wait for you. Lift your voice, you're my comfort. You're my comfort when I feel forsaken. My refuge and my short foundation. My soul will wait, my soul will wait for you. I believe we serve a God that answers prayers. Having to believe we serve a God that loves for us to pour out our heart to Him. He does. Come on, let's lift our hands in worship. Come on, pouring out. Pouring out of hearts before. other, remind each other. because we're reliable, dependable, consistent. 
are trustworthy, but because you're all those things and more. And so with our lifted hand, we surrender to your character. We claim in front of our brothers and sisters in Christ, and maybe some who aren't, that you are a God who hears our prayers. And we might not get every answer that we want when we want it, but that doesn't mean you're not God. Thank you for loving us. For the believer in our midst today who's hurting the most, who's in the darkest place, who's in a, in a place where they feel is, is inescapable, would you be near to them, please? Lord, in a moment, we're going to baptize. This is a sign of your presence in our church. The hand of the Lord is on Fellowship Baptist Church, and we want to say thank you for that. But in a moment's notice, all of that can change. So help us to be ready. Help us to trust you when we're on the mountaintop. So when we get in the valley, valley we'll already have a strong relationship with you. Thank you for the church today. What a spirit in this place. Bless them. Help them and be glorified. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said a good and hearty amen. Amen. You may be seated. To God be the glory. If you're a guest here today, we are honored by your presence. We hope you felt welcome. We hope that the service has been a help and a blessing to you. Um, we would ask you to fill out a Connect card if you don't mind. It's in the seat back in front of you. You can drop it in the offering plate um, right after the the service or, or at the end of the service here in the offering and uh, it, it's really important to us that you fill that out for a couple of reasons I promise you we aren't going to come by your house and 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 chase you down anything like that but Pastor David will look over those connection cards uh, this afternoon and at some point this week he'll just make himself available if you have any questions about the church or you need some help spiritually in your life that's all we'll do it's all we want to do and uh, so so I hope you take time to fill that out and it, it'll be a huge blessing drop it in the offering plate uh, when you're done, the Cake Cafe is open today, by the way. That's our coffee shop. And uh, you can get all the coffee you want from there, of course. And they've got some really, really good homemade desserts in there for a dollar a piece. Uh, they've got some lemon berry crepes. they got some cherry pie bars. That Kentucky peach pudding. I think it's still a dollar a piece. And so um, enjoy that. Grab an Easter invite card on your way out. Plan to come back tonight at 6 o'clock for a prayer meeting. Plan to stick around uh, next Sunday, grab a map, and take your family out and invite people to Easter Sunday. We got a lot to do. Got a lot to do. And I hope the church will be all hands on deck, getting the job done for sake of the gospel. You never know. God could come back pretty quick. I say God could come back pretty quick. I don't want him to catch our church relaxing. We got to be busy for the gospel while we have a chance. Amen? So I hope that that you'll do that. We're going to show you a quick announcement video. Those that are getting ready to bat get baptized, they're still getting ready. So we're going to show you a quick announcement video. Then we're going to take up our offering. Then we're going to celebrate the baptism of these folks. And don't forget, this isn't a funeral. If we left them underwater, it'd be a funeral. It'd be really sad. We bring them out of the water and we celebrate with them. They were once lost, but now they are found. They were once blind, but now they see. They were once wandering without a church family. Now they're part of a church family. And we celebrate th that with them. Amen? All right, let's watch the announcement video, take the offering, and we'll celebrate baptism. Hello, and thank you for joining us today at Fellowship. We are so glad you joined us for worship today. But before we head out, here are a few announcements. There will be a baptism during the morning service on April 2nd. If you would like to get baptized, see Pastor David or fill out a connection card. The final Heart to Heart of the Year begins this Tuesday, March 28th at 7 p.m. in the auditorium. This will be a special Heart to Heart as Pastor Tyler will be bringing the message. This will be a special time as the ladies of fellowship will spend a time in worship and enjoy some sweet fellowship with one another. This is a ministry for ladies in the 7th grade and above. On Sunday, April 2nd, we'll be having a fundraiser for our youth department following the morning service. This is a great way to fund their trips this summer. We hope you can come support them for this fundraiser. For those interested in teen camp this year, there will be an informational meeting after the evening service on Sunday, April 16th in the Fellowship Hall. If you have any questions, you can see Tanner Walton. 
Easter Sunday is quickly approaching, and we hope you make plans to join us as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We will have two identical services. These services will include gospel-centered preaching, corporate worship, and special music from our 50-voice choir. And leading up to Easter, we will have a community-wide outreach to promote Easter at Fellowship. This will take place on April 2nd. We hope you can come and play a part in inviting individuals and families who may be in need of the gospel. And finally, if you are a church member, you will not want to miss out on perhaps one of the most important communion services of the year. This will take place on April 5th at 7 p.m. We will take part in a very special time in corporate worship, scripture reading, and uniting our church to do this ordinance. We hope to make plans to attend and get involved during these Easter events. FBA and LLA are having a spring fundraiser called Egg My Yard. Allow us to hide your Easter eggs, provide you with an egg hunt in a box, or use it as a special surprise for someone else. You can sign up through the QR code located at the Resource Center, directly linked to a form for you to fill out with the information we need. If you don't want an egg hunt, there are other ways to help support the school. You can purchase a virtual egg for a donation of $15 or more. You can also donate plastic eggs and candy if you'd like to support the fundraiser in another way. Church, we hope you can get behind the school and donate in one of these ways. Kristen Kessler and Shane Bowman will be getting married on May 13th. If you would like to be a blessing to them as they prepare for this special day, there will be a come and go bridal shower for Kristen on April 11th from 6 to 7.30 p.m. This will take place at the home of Simona Farrow. Those are all of the announcements for today. Be sure to come back tonight for evening service at 6 p.m. Amen. Let's have a word of prayer for our offering. Father, thank you for the generosity of your people. Sometimes it's hard to give. Sometimes it's easy to give. Whatever we find ourselves in, whatever season financially, I pray that we'd still be obedient and seeking first the kingdom of God. Provide for the needs of our ministry so that we can go forward and reach our world for Christ. Bless the offering in Jesus' name. Amen. Give unto the Lord. Church, this is baptism Sundays are my favorite Sundays of the year because we get to watch uh, Christians that have put their faith in Jesus uh, go public and let the church know that they're following Jesus and want to be a part of our church family. And we get to receive them into our membership and acknowledge that they're also in the family of God because they put their faith in Christ. Um, so we'll begin. Kensington, come on ahead. This is Kensington Kalowski. Um, Kensington got saved one of our last communion services and it was actually before while the service was getting started um, she realized that she wasn't a Christian and uh, that's kind of what prompted this in her heart and so she uh, told her parents she needed to get saved and, and trust Christ and she did she has her faith in, in Jesus to take her to heaven to forgive her of her sins and uh, she let her parents know she wanted to follow the Lord in baptism 
as well, uh, which is what she's doing right now. So praise God. Kensington, do you know Jesus? Yes. Kensington, upon your public profession of the Lord Jesus as your Savior and in obedience to his command, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death and raised in the likeness of his resurrection to walk in newness of life. child who was saved, uh, Jeremiah, uh, if you don't know him, his parents are Victor and Yolydia. They weren't raised in this church, but praise the Lord, several years ago, God saved them and brought them here. And they're raising their kids in this church and teaching them about Jesus. And uh, Jeremiah put his faith in Christ on the way home after a Sunday uh, when he heard the gospel up in junior church. And uh, on the drive home, he put his faith in Jesus, asked him to save him. And so we're going to baptize Jeremiah today. Jeremiah, do you know Jesus? Yes. Jeremiah, upon your public profession of the Lord Jesus as your Savior and in obedience to his command, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death and raised in the likeness of his resurrection to walk in newness of life. just said he's so wet, and he is. It's wonderful. This is art. Art's wife, Angela, got saved a couple years ago. Uh, if you don't know Angela, her parents are Marlon and Dorothy, who are uh, reached by our former pastor, Brother Bill Prater. And, uh, you know, some people, they hear the gospel once, and they get saved right away. Then there's other people. Like Art. He came to church for a long time, uh, but eventually God got a hold of his heart. Uh, he did a Bible study with Pastor Tyler, going through the Gospel of Mark, and received the Lord Jesus. And today, he's uh, getting baptized to go public with his faith in our Savior. So, Art, do you know Jesus? Yes, I do. Art, upon your public profession of the Lord Jesus, and in obedience to his command, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death and raised in the likeness of his resurrection to walk in newness of life. We got a couple that's getting baptized together today. Uh, this is Saul and Claudia. I hope you've gotten to meet Saul and Claudia. Uh, but they started coming to our church. Uh, Tanner and Taryn Walton, our uh, youth pastor and his wife, invited them in their home. Started studying the Bible with them, and uh, both uh, both of these uh, both of these people saw their need, their sin, and their need for the Lord Jesus to be saved by Him. And they both put their faith in Christ. And today they're going to get baptized together. And join the fellowship family. If you if you haven't met them yet, I hope you get a chance to. Um, they love being saved. They're in love with Jesus, and we love having them here with us. So, Saul, do you know Jesus? Yes. Saul, upon your public public profession of the Lord Jesus as your Savior and in obedience to His command, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of His death and raised in the likeness of His resurrection to walk in newness of life. And this is Claudia Saul's wife. Isn't it wonderful they're getting baptized together today? So happy for them, I know. Uh, you are too. Claudia, do you know Jesus? 
Claudia, upon your public profession of the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, and in obedience to his command, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death, and raised in the likeness of his resurrection, to walk in newness of life. Thank you, church. Church said amen. You know what I want to do real quick? I want you to stand to your feet. Brother Kay, I want you to come, please. One of our deacons. I want you just to pray for these folks that just got baptized. As he prays out loud, I want you to pray. And, and you might not remember their names, but I want you to pray. And I want you to ask God to help them. They just took a magnificent step of obedience. So would you ask God to just cover them and be with them as they continue to follow him? Brother Kay, you word our prayer. After he prays, you're dismissed. Heavenly Father, so thankful for the opportunity to be in your house today. What a blessing to see the baptismal water stirred, a sign of a growing church, a sign of you at work. pray that you'd be with these that uh, were baptized today. I pray that you'd be with Art, that you just uh, continue to help him grow in you for Saul and Claudia as well, for Jeremiah and uh, for Kensington. pray that you'd be with each one of them, uh, that we would be what they need and uh, help us to welcome them into our membership and help us uh, as they strive to, fo- to continue to follow you. Help us to be uh, that for others as well. And as we go out this week, I pray you just help us to uh, be back tonight to be challenged to be for our prayer meeting and uh, be about your business. Give you the thanks for all of that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.